look, I, it. I didn't even see that one. We, we, we're about okay. to go on the record. We're about to hit the record. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right. Uh, Mad Hatter. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, we'll see what's happening over here. Uh, cool. It says we're live on Facebook, y'all. So uh, what, my, what my girlfriend told me was uh, when you go live, you got to, like, leave a little bit of space in between, let the people join. So that's what we're going to do right here. Here's a quick question while we're waiting for the people to uh, join. When you're on with the person who actually wrote this song, do you have to tell people I don't own the copyrights to this music? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I, or, or, I'm, not, I'm not tripping though. That no, okay, so I so I can ask directly. Do I have permission to play this song, Mr. Rose? Yes, you, you, you have permission. How about okay. DJ okay. Jazzy Jeff? Who, who, DJ Jazzy Jeff, who I did the song with, he's playing it on his um. I want to say his Saturday uh, lunch break joint, uh, Saturday, you know, uh, outside pool party, whatever. And yeah. he gets, uh, he gets a, a letter, a cease and desist from YouTube. You lie. Uh, you know, you don't own the right. And he's like, how are you going to hit me for <laughs> my actual song, his actual song? You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah, so that's just funny. They they, they, they hunting right now, boy. They they trying to lock down that Yeah, music. yeah. Yeah. Every penny they can get. So we couldn't be that mad. We was like, hey, look, you know. That's That's crazy. You know what I'm saying? So it's all good. Yeah. Cancel 2020. Cancel 2020, man. Yeah. Listen. So, yeah. like, wow. This song has so much, like, it's funny because I wanted to start from the beginning, but I, I guess we got to start from right here because this yeah, song is fun. so poignant and it's saying so much. Um, so um, with that being said, um, I think what we'll do is uh, go ahead and introduce the crew. What's up to everyone who is tuning in? Um, if you're on my page, you probably know who I am. Or I'm hoping you know who I am at least. Uh, I'm Harry Colbert, and this is Destination Unknown. It's a new podcast that I'm starting, and the reason I call it Destination Unknown is because it's not going to be defined by any one particular thing. We'll talk about music. We'll talk about sports. We'll talk about politics. Um, it's a very wide-ranging uh, show. But as many of you know, I have an absolute love and affinity for music, and in particular, uh, the subgenre uh, that's known as neo-soul or alternative soul, as they're calling it now. And um, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, my first guest since I think it was 2004, and uh, we'll get into a little bit of that, but I'm just going to uh, read just a little bit about the man. Um, his name is Eric Roberson. He's uh, And this is from his website. It's ericrobersonmusic.com. Grammy Award nominee singer, songwriter, and producer Eric Roberson continues to break, break boundaries as an independent artist in an industry dominated by major labels, manufactured sounds, and mainstream radio. Described as the original pioneer of the independent music and R&B soul music movement, Eric has achieved major milestones in his career from being a successful songwriter and producer. We'll get into more of that. For notable artists such as Gilly from Philly, Jill Scott, Music Soul Child, Dwele, Vivian Green, and countless others, as well as headlining sold-out tours across the country, uh, we've been fortunate enough to have sold out shows in St. Louis and Minnesota mm -hmm. with him. This Broadway, New Jersey, and Howard University, HU, you know, I'm saying that for all y'all Howard people, uh, alone became the first independent artist to be nominated for a BET Award in 2007 and was the recipient of the Underground Artist of the Year Award by BTJ Virtual uh, Awards with Rasan Patterson, another dope, 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 dope artist who I'd love to get on here. So with that being said, along with my co-host, James Biko, one of the dopest DJs in the nation, voted by the Riverfront Times as the best DJ, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Eric Roberson. What's man, good? thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. All good, man. What's good, brother? Man, this is love right here. Straight up. This is love. Indeed. Indeed. 
when you when you're able to like sit down and just straight up talk to two people who you admire and respect in the music business, it's just um, sometimes I, I pinch myself and, and ask, "Is life really real?" You know. So, um, uh, Biko, how you doing? Good, man. This is awesome. This is really dope. Uh, yeah. I I echo what you what you're saying, man. I mean, that's how I feel about you and and Arrow, man. Um, Mr. Robeson, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. Uh, I'm a student, you know what I mean? Um, and you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm here to, to listen, uh, chime in when I can, but you know, I'm definitely honored that you, uh, you know, invited me here for your inaugural episode. I appreciate it, man. Congrats. It's love. too. It's love. It's love. Thank you. Thank you so much. And in fact, y'all got to join together. We'll get into that a little later. Make it but, happen. um, yeah, but um, going back to uh, Cancel 2020, because it's so new and so now, um, take me through that. That's you, that's Jazzy Jeff. Uh, obviously, it uh, was written within this current moment. Um, take me through the process, and I use that word particularly because we're going to talk about the process later, but take me through the yeah. process of that song. I mean, the song's not even two weeks old. Um so you know I, I as a writer i'm very open to whatever i'm like just open to just the natural course of things are are going to happen they belong in its own course right and like everyone else uh i think friday evening i was looking at my phone and it just started really buzzing really crazy <clears throat> and i and i saw like just the reaction that i saw the messages that was coming up the curse words that were coming <laughs> that were coming up on my phone. I looked at my wife and I said, I think somebody passed. I didn't know who it was. So then I started scrolling to like see who it was. And so then when I saw it was was was, was Chad Bozeman, I mean I was I was floored. I was crushed. Um uh I knew Chad back from Howard Day days. Of course very proud of, you know, his accomplishments and just a thorough, amazing guy, you know. Uh so I was really, really floored. And that's my way of coping, man. Like, if I can put some headphones on, if I can get behind a microphone, that night was, was either I was going to sleep or I was going to work, you know what I mean? And, you know, the kids were still up. It was a Friday. They were all, you know, wilding, you know. And um, eventually I disappeared. And it just so happened that Jeff had so, – so me and Jeff were working on a project. It's me, Jeff, and a, another brother named Cody Tatum. Um, it's a three-headed monster. We're, we're, we're putting this project together. So he had sent me this track the other day, and he called it Boycott. And when I went downstairs, I actually recorded something else first, and then I pulled that up. Because I just I, there was no way if I stopped working, I would start thinking. If I start thinking, I'm going to start crying. If I start crying, you know, just, I'm like, man, I just got to just, I just can't. Phone is going on, on fire, mind you, as well. And I pulled this track up and it says boycott. And that's probably what put me in the mind state of like cancel 2020. I was like, wow, he called this track boycott. <laughs> so just listening to the track, I, when I hit record, first thing I said was, you know, dear cancel culture, can we cancel this whole year? Which is how I really felt at the time. I was like, you know, it's crazy where, and just keep it 100, man. I mean, I think the world has suffered, but man, black people have suffered so bad in this year when you think of the most catastrophic stuff that happened this year and this is not to belittle COVID, it had nothing to do with COVID. right i mean kobe bryant kobe bryant one of my top five athletes of all time one of my favorite john lewis one of my favorite people of all time bill withers my top five top three favorite artists of all time you yeah. know and that, and that that had nothing to do with COVID. just any year that happens I'm pretty much floored in, in checking out, you know what I'm saying? And I say checking out more in, uh, in, in a numbness. I, I'm not by no means encouraging anybody to like check out. Right. right. But, but, um, they checking us out anyway, but you know, it's, and then, and then you look at all the racism, the George Floyd, you know, it's, 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 man, it's a lot. It's a lot. So I think, Hearing the news on Chad, man, I just got behind the microphone and that's what I said. That's it's like it was really it was really that. And then the crazy thing was two days later, we hadn't finished the song. I had posted it, what I had done, and then it 
got the energy that it did and it, and it was it was great and it was healing for people i think that's the reason why i posted it in the first place and then the next two days later i was we weren't going to put a second verse on the song we were like let's just uh Kyrie was going to play strings on the end of it we were going to post it be done you put it out whoever needs it and my dad called my mom called me that that sunday morning i was cooking breakfast and my dad got on the phone and while my dad was talking to me about another song, he started crying on the phone. And that's just, I mean, you think about how, and think of the impact. You, you know what I'm saying? Like my, my father is crying on the phone. You know what I mean? While I'm talking to him, just show how heavy everything is right now. And I mean, it put me back into like a very tough place where I was at once again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, babe, can you take care of these kids for a minute? Because I got to go downstairs. I got to go downstairs. I put the headphones on. That's something to do. On. Right. Yeah. And the first thing I said was, was I had to talk with my dad, and he cried this morning. And after that, the rest of it just uh-huh. showed up. And I think, you know, for me, that's writing anyway, man. I don't believe in writer's block. I believe in writer's blindness. I think we choose what to not write something. You wow. know what I mean? There's there's plenty enough to write about. I could write really right now about our friendship. You know what I'm saying? I could write about the idea that me and Bingo make do in the future. You know what I'm saying? There's so many options, and and we make a choice to say I'm not going to write about that because maybe somebody's not interested. Right. For me, it wasn't like oh, this could be a hit and whatever. I was writing from a place of pain and frustration, man. Period. Okay. I think I think that's the same place where, when when Marvin wrote What's Going On. He wrote from the same same place. It's just a, it, you don't know if it might be listened to for a week. It might be listened to for centuries. You know, at the end of the day, if if you are in a certain place and you got to get it out your system, you get it out your system. Period. And when and when you talk about your dad, see, first of all, I'm a fan of like old school vinyl, old school tapes and CDs um, where yeah. they have the album art and the liner notes. And I remember, like, as soon as I would get your joints, I'd open it up because you'd have all the lyrics and you'd have the meaning behind the song. And, and, and I can't remember which one of the uh, albums it is, but in the liner notes, you said um, you often you refer to in your music, uh, a wise man once said, and you said, generally, you're talking about your dad right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I know that there's a very... Um, or, uh, true and, and and profound connection between you two. Yeah, uh-huh. and, and 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 it and I also had to make sure because I got pay homage to him. It's 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 always going to be the two people, either my dad or my grandfather, who mm-hmm. who passed away some years ago. Um, but both both when I see a wise man once said, it's it's those two. You know what I mean? Um, because they they they've instilled so much wisdom. You know, and I know for a fact I got I got my songwriting. My songwriting came from my grandfather. Mm-hmm. Came from now, mind you, he didn't write songs, but he was a he was a preacher in uh, in North Carolina, and I I remember when he would talk, and his head would go back, and he'd go ah, mm-hmm. and that ah, that's that when that line hits you, when that when it arrives, when that mm-hmm. theory, when that thought, when that chord progression, that bass line, that that ah, and I chase that. I've, I've been watching, I watched as a little kid, I watched my grandfather have that moment when he was talking to us, when he was pastoring, when he was just fellowshipping. He, he, would, he would be going somewhere and he'd go, uh, he would get excited because he realized it. He didn't have it, but two, sec- he, two seconds before that, he didn't have it. And it arrived and he, and he would like almost hop. So like that's, that's. He was the best one, just opened himself up to the yeah, spirit. And that's the goal. So, I mean, you learn that early. I learned that early, man. I learned that early. So, I, I'm I'm constantly looking for that hop, that that the thing that makes me go like, oh, you know what I mean? And capture it and capture it because it's, ma- it's, it's magic. It's really magic. You know what I mean? And uh, I, I've been fortunate to catch a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? Would you, would you say, um, hearing you talk about, you know, how there might, well, from what I'm understanding from you, you don't really believe in writer's block, right? No. I I think that those artists who might say that they have writer's block, would you agree that they they're mostly hit driven? Because because they're 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 so pressured to to make a hit. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. As, as you know, whereas 
an artist like like you, you're you're making art. You're making art, and like you said, whether it's a hit or not, you know, you're making art for the people who appreciate what you do, and you know, it might be listened to now or hundreds, you know, years from now or whatever. You know what I mean? And for people who, it, I I. I, I feel like those people who say I have writer's block, those are people who tend to basically write about the same thing like over and over again. You yeah. know what I mean? And and, yeah. and don't allow themselves to the space that you, you're you talking about. You know what I mean? Like you can write about anything that inspires you and that can be anything, right? Absolutely. And so, Good. yeah, Good. I, I, yeah. At the end of the day, you don't know what's going to work. Right. I really don't. I mean, uh, Tom, Tommy Davidson said something amazing. It changed my life. He said, the only person who knows what works is God. That's it. Uh -huh. I don't care how much an expert you are until it happens. And then, and then to add to it, what I've learned through my years, the only person to show you what works is the crowd. So mm -hmm. I can sit here in my studio and hear him like, I can't tell you how many times I played something and said, woo. I'm about to order that Bentley. I'm, it's it. This is, this is the one. I'm, I'm selling a house. I'm buying a new house. Been, it's four times. It, it's, I can't tell you how many times I heard something. This is it. Everyone's right. going to lose their mind. Everyone. And yeah. and it and it's crickets. And then you had this one song where you kind of sitting at the piano and this little idea and you're like, eh. And you almost throw it away. And just by chance, you post it. Or just by chance, a friend walks in and hears it. You know, a friend's girlfriend comes in with him, and I used to sit living here working on the idea. You look back, and she's crying buckets. And you're like, "Oh, this song is special. This song is special." You know, so let's get to the source of writer's block first and foremost. What is writer's block? Writer's block is when you're being overly critical about what you're creating. It's not the fact that you can't create; it's the fact that you're being overly critical about what you're creating. Right? You're, you're prejudging before you allow it to manifest itself so ah, nobody's gonna be interested yeah. so for example if you win a grammy and then you go back into the studio and you say and you start working this idea and go da, 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 and you go but is this gonna win me a grammy guess what you already got in the way of it. <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah. so, so success yeah. can yeah. success can create writer's block just as much as you know uh, you know it's almost like oh i got my heart broken now i'm hurting so bad I don't want to share this pain with anybody. I don't want anybody to see my pity, so I won't write. That's writer's block. Don't and, mean you can't. Don't and mean to you me, that's write. that's the. And that's what, to me, that's the total opposite of, of art of, of like you, like not being willing to show that vulnerability. You know yeah. what I mean? Like being vulnerable is is a large part of, of creating art in my, the way I see it. Writing is nothing but revealing yourself. That's all it is. Every, yeah. every person that you have hanging up there from Les Nubians to 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 uh, Lauren Hill, every person behind you, they 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 revealed something yeah. of themselves, and you can feel it. You when Mary right. when Mary Mary's first second album, even if she wasn't writing those songs, there was a certain pain My in life. her voice. I, I, was just, I was just telling a student earlier today, um, and she had a line where she said, "I felt it in my heart," and her next line was saying, "My heart." She repeated it. And I said, okay, that second time you said my heart means something different than the first time. And you, you have to think of it differently. And if you think of it differently, you will feel it differently. You will say it differently. You will sing it differently. Right? So it's like, so it's about feeling it. But the moment that you start guarding yourself saying, well, I don't want anybody to see how I feel. You can't, you can't go any for, forward. You know oh. what I mean? It's like, oh. this whole thing is about being vulnerable. You can't worry about, I mean, it goes all the way down from, a skateboarder, if, you, if you're going to be a skateboarder, at some point you're going to break your arm. At some point you're going to fall off that board. You right. know what I'm saying? You're scared of that. <laughs> so, so I don't think you writer, should be skating. At some right. point, somebody's going to see your work and see how weak you once were or see how sad you once had a moment of sadness. They'll see how fragile you were at some point. That's part of writing. You know what I'm saying? That's part of the, yeah. the the reveal. So it just goes back to like, for me, it's it's when you have writer's block, and when you feel you have writer's block, I always tell everybody, keep writing and just put it aside. The next day, go back to it. I promise you, I promise you, if you if you trust this process, if you say, oh, I can't, I can't write today, but yet you still write, you'll look at that work tomorrow and you'll be like, wow, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was. And, right. and and that, and that goes for not just music. I mean, I'm working on a book, and 
I've been writing it and writing it and writing it. I've been writing it for years. And I put it down because um, I was like, I know it means a lot to me, but what will it mean to the general public? And then I had to get out of the mindset of what it means to the general public and say, look, I felt in the beginning I had a story to tell. I still feel I have a story to tell. If the only person I tell it to is myself, then that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. What's the purpose of it? We have to define what the purpose is, you know? And, and, and at the end of the day, struggle is good. I'm going to tell you, like, I, you know, I, I majored in musical theater, right? And I learned that even applies now. The shows that I felt I was, I was not as connected, the shows that I might have been fighting through hoarseness or had a, a cold and was fighting through the cold to still deliver the character was some of the best performances. Now, mind you, I'm going, oh, I'm stuffy and uh, nobody's going to enjoy this. And people are like, wow, I saw that you were connected. Why? Because there was a struggle in staying connected. And what happens is when we struggle in staying connected, we automatically think, oh, I ain't got it today. All right. When that's actually the day you got it more. The day when it's just sitting here flowing and it's like, oh, I just can't stop. It might be too easy in that moments, you know? And, yeah. and we go back to, let's, let's go back to Kobe Bryant. I use him, I, I've always used him as an example. The days that his shot is off, what do you think Kobe does? Keep shooting. Shoot. <laughs> Shoot. And, and, and he's shooting, is he thinking about that he missed the last five shots? No. He think about the next shot. Is this next uh, the form I got to take? So when you when it's not hitting, what do you do? Keep swinging. Right. Period. Now, now the answer to your question, you made a great point. Now, the bigger you are, now if you're baby face and the demands of having a certain level of success comes and different different things of that nature, yeah, that that's outside pressures. That's outside pressures. But at the end of the day, it doesn't have anything to do with art. And really, if we keep it 100. Babyface, because of his style, has dictated what the world is listening to. So he, he's already winning. The more he stays true to himself and reveals himself, the more he's still going to claim those chart, chart topping things. That goes the same for Timberland. They go, how did you get there? Did you get there because you were calculated? Okay, if I move this here, it's going to go number one. Or were you chasing a feeling? When Timberland went boom, to boom, to boom, boom, ticka, ticka, ticka. And I remember being in Atlanta, and every single person looked at looked at the TV and said. <laughs> And then went to their drum machines immediately. Completely new drums, drum pattern. To try to imitate that feeling he had. We, ha we hadn't heard that. So, so, so at the end of the day, okay, let's say you're the biggest producer in the world, or you're the biggest songwriter in the world. Are you trying to write a song that pleases the label and that you feel everybody's going to go, wow, this is such a big hit? Or are you trying to make something feel good inside your spirit in your writing or in your beat that makes you go, oh, oh my God. Guess what? There's a better chance that if it makes you go like that, it's going to make them go like that. But what happens right. when we, the further we get up, the more we forget that. Exactly. Exactly. You know? Look, I mean, Chappelle, Dave Chappelle said famously that the first season of Chappelle show, they were just making it for themselves. Like they made it as if nobody was watching. Of course. And you don't, the most classic season. The best, the best things are usually that, are usually people making it as if nobody's watching, nobody's listening, except for that circle, because they're just, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're trusted um, colleagues and everything, and they're, and they're just basically trying to impress each other, and that's genuine, that's, that's genuine, you know what I mean? For, for most artists, uh, recording artists, in my, in my estimation, their best album is their first album. Because the A&Rs ain't gotten ahead. Uh, the label ain't telling them they need to do this, that, and the other. It's like, okay, this is what I came with. A lot and, of times it's like that, yeah. And, right. And, 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 to be, and to be fair, even with that, though, which, you also have, which is very interesting, you also got to think that that is the first album you're writing about your entire life. You're starting from the poems that you wrote in junior high school. You have sure. a plethora of things to work with. And you're, 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 you know, you're bringing all that together to make this first album. And then this, here comes the success of the first album. And now you have two years or a year to now match that same process. Right, right. All the pressures that goes on top of it. So it's, it's, it's a little tricky, but, but guess what? It's, it's kind of like, man, if you could just remember, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, I had an album called Music Fan First. It was the best 
thing that could ever yeah. happen to me. Not 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 that and that it wasn't even an album, it was the awakening of the album. Mm-hmm. It's called Music Fan First because be honest with you, at that time, especially I was having a lot of vocal issues at that time, music became an obligation more than it became something I was a fan of. When when we when we would do a two hour concert and sign CDs for an hour and then I would get in the car or a van or whatever it was and they started blasting music, we'd be like, yo man, turn the music off, man. Mm, I just want yeah. some quiet. Right. And it was like, wow, when did we get there? <laughs> we get to the point where I wasn't singing in the shower anymore. When did we get to the point when radio comes on and I didn't go, Ooh, that's that's dope. What's that? You know? So I had to get back to the point of going, Wait a minute, what am I doing? Let me remember what I prayed for. You know what I'm saying? Didn't mean it wasn't going to be no struggle in it. Didn't mean I wasn't going to be beat up sometimes and still had to get up six o'clock in the morning to go to another city to do another show. It, 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 you, there's going to be some rough times in it, but yo, music has been the soundtrack of my life. Let's, F- remi- F- Let's F- remind F- them of that uh, music fan first. Um, that's, uh, see if we uh, chop up this new list. Yeah, yeah. This is one of my favorite songs when you do it live. I know this. Because a lot of times you open the show with it. Man. Yeah. Good feeling. <laughs> Shout out to Brett Baker as well, man. My brother Brett Baker. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't even trying to make an album at the time, but he was sending me such fire. That man, that album just came together real easy. This song is just so dope. And then when you hit him with the love jaw, <laughs> like, yeah. So who, now you said uh, Brett Baker produced that? Yeah, Brett Baker produced majority, I mean, like 75% of that album. There were a couple other producers on on the album, but he did he did majority of Borrow, Borrow You, uh, oh. Power to Kiss His Hold, Still. Uh, I was uh, just watching the video still. Yeah, the two the two songs we got nominated for, uh, Brett Brett uh Brett did both of those songs. So, and it was crazy because it was a process, man. It was like I would uh I would cut songs, and then I would whatever time I went to bed, and when I woke up, he would send me a new idea, a new beat or whatever, and I would I had this like stereo system in the bathroom at that time. So my morning would start up by putting, put, loading, like plugging the laptop into whatever speakers I had in the, in the bathroom. And then just in that process, the song, by the time I showered, brush my teeth, whatever, the song was already done. Mm. So every song, every song in the album was written in the bathroom. Every yeah. single one of them. <laughs> you know, wow. sitting on the toilet, sitting in the shower, whatever. Every single song. Because mind you, you know, what's interesting is creativity also has a rhythm. Right. Yeah. So a lot of times we have to, and, and that's a life thing, right? But with creativity has a rhythm. And once you realize there's a rhythm to it, you can catch on to it. So that I wasn't changing up my rhythm at that point. Now, at this point now, I know I'm going to work to a certain time. I'm waking up around a certain time. I'm expecting a new beat the next morning. The next morning I get that new beat, the same process goes through. I'm ex- So I'm expecting the song to be there. And, and, and this is the other, so, you know, my new theory, which is crazy, that I've been kind of talking to a lot of friends about, is that we have to, we have to reevaluate our relationship with creativity. See, a lot of times we treat creativity like it's a friend we don't deserve. When at the end of the day, it's, it's like a best friend. It's, you know, you real talk, if, you, if, if your best friend called you and you was busy, you say, yo, yo, fam, I'm playing with my, my son right now. Let me hit you back. All right, no problem. And you might not hit him back till tomorrow. And by the time you call him back, what he wanted to talk about, yeah. he may have forgotten. But guess yeah. what? Y'all probably, probably still going to have a great conversation because the relationship y'all have. It's like, wow, man, I forgot what I called you about. But, yo, you saw that game last night? Oh, that joint was crazy. <laughs> and then y'all going y'all gonna to powwow. And y'all gonna, you know what I mean? And creativity has to be that way, too. I used to walk into that bathroom knowing the song was going to be there. Like, I counted on it. And, and, and what happens is we think, like, oh, man, if I don't write this song. What Pr- Prince said it. Prince said if, I, if, if he don't go in the studio, creativity is going to go visit Michael Jackson. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I and I don't look at it that way. I, I'm like I'm like 
I'm like, yo, creativity needs me just as much as I need it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It needs a vessel. So it's like, yo, man, I appreciate that you showed up. Here, what I got for you. As long as I stay clear, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because a lot of times creativity may show up and I'll be like, nah. And that's that writer's <laughs> block stuff. Man, you know when, I mean? when I'm in the shower, that's when, like, so when I'm in my quote unquote day job and my journalist trade, or what, and even not being a journalist, but just thinking about the next show that I want to produce or whatever it is. When I'm in the shower and the hot water is hitting me and I'm feeling good, I'm writing in my head. Yes. Like I, I don't have a pen and paper or a recorder in there, but I'm writing in my head and I'm like, okay, remember this. Okay, I'm taking it from there to there. Or, oh yeah, let me call so and so. I bet you this is a dope concept or whatever. Yes. Um, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm uh, miss out on a lot of artists say when they keep a pen and pad by their bed and because they get so many inspirations from dreams and they just wake up and just. Yeah, I mean, it, whether you whether you right before you go to sleep, right when you wake up, that's that's a great moment. I mean, a shower is a great moment for me. Songs, business plans, marketing ideas, video ideas, you know, all that stuff comes from those those moments of isolation. You right. know, those moments of like, you know, you go in the shower, it ain't but so much to think about, you know. So it's it's a good moment to kind of reflect. It's it's, it's funny because like once again, that's why I caught this podcast is called destination unknown because i'm gonna let the conversation take like i have notes written out and all that i'm like okay we gotta hit this this and this but you keep taking it in different wonderful directions and so let's just go into it because you're yeah. talking about the process let's talk about this project the process yeah well the process is a group of people uh that i started building around it was at first was a private facebook page and for me it was like a lot of it was like you know People don't read credits anymore. The, the, the art form of, of knowing who played what or who wrote what is gone now because, you know, the digital streaming aspect doesn't really always come with that format of being able to read the information. So I was like, what if you show everything? And I was like, Man, well, what if I form a group? And it started with the Earth, Wind & Fire albums I made. I made three we will get uh, EPs. Into yeah. Yeah, made three EPs every three months. And I told, so before I ever made it, before I even wrote a song, I, I asked people, I said, hey, would you want to join a process group where to enter in is to, is to really buy the album and then you can watch me make the album, you know, and I, and I made one in three months and then, then we went on to the next one, made the next one in three months, then we made the next one in three months. And from there we kept it going. And, uh, and now we're four years and it's, it, it, it's, a, um, it's about a, a little over a thousand people now. We moved it to a, a Patreon page now but it's uh, jointheprocess.com, and and it's uh, it's been a great thing, because for me, what is what it is is every song I do, they get a copy of. I made a whole album for them that I never released publicly, um, that I love. I mean, it's a great, great record. Uh, we do concerts on there for them internally. You know, we've done three concerts, virtual concerts, and one actual live concert for the process members since we since we've had had the, the site. Um, and it's just a good thing. But for me, the benefit is that I get a chance to know what works immediately. If I post a song and everybody's talking about it for the next day or so, I know I got something. But if I post something and it's kind of like crickets, okay, that, that needs a little bit more work. Right. Right. So, so it's, been a, it's been a good community. When, before the pandemic hit, when I would go to sh Chicago, that process group of Chicago, Chicagoans would come to the sound check. And they would sit in the sound check so they could even see the process of us getting ready for a show. Um, so it's, it's been a really, really good, um, it's how I'm doing my music from now on, to be honest with you. And, and, and don't mess around and let, let the number, let, let it get, my goal is to get to like 3000 people. If I get to 3000 people, we're doing some amazing stuff. At that point, I'm like, I'm calling Layla Hathaway and going, all right, Layla Hathaway, I need you to do an album for my group. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're, we're bringing in guests, we're bringing in producers We you know, and we're already, I mean, it's crazy. We do a weekly podcast. They they done started a thing called Process at the Dark. That they that's that's not even me. Like that's, <laughs> that's that's them. They get together and watch movies together. Just it's it's, it out. <laughs> it, it's 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 a beautiful thing. It's 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 music lovers. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. It's music lovers, and uh, and it's just an encouraging place, uh, hub to to come in and and create. You know, so it's it's been cool. And there's some great producers, some great songwriters in there too. Um, so we have a good time, man. So I just, anybody, anybody interested, go to jointheprocess.com. 
I, I think everybody would be pleased. We we had a, a fantasy football draft this year, uh, just earlier today. So I mean, it's on. It's 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 its own world now. It's it's like completely That's crazy. Tough, yeah. yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. And, and what's crazy? So going back to the Earth, Wind, and Fire, um, like I'm a promoter um, and have been and, and have been for years, and you get flooded with uh, a lot of. CDs and stuff like that that people are giving you music all the time. So at one point in my career, young in my career, I used to like, oh, well, I don't buy such and such. People give me stuff. Then I got to the point where I understood, nah, I need to support the, these, the, these artists. They need um, not only me putting them on stage, but they need the support of, of the dollars as well. And so I will, any, any artist, and, and my former business partner would always say as well, but uh, any of the uh, artists that I work with, yeah, I have all your music. And thankfully, you say, hey, man, hold on to this. But most of it, I'm like, nah, you know, hey, I'm going to buy that. And so I, when, when we went out with the Earth, Wind & Fire online, I immediately chopped it up, went on there, bought it, got the packages in the mail with the signed CDs. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, um, and I was like, Earth was beautiful. Wind was just calm yeah fire was fire fire um was the most different album I've, the, the most i can't say difficult but by far the most different album i've ever made you know and it was needed i think it, and and uh, you know i you know i'm not one who often goes back to listen to my music after i put it out but i listened to that fire album recently and i was like um i, I can't believe i mean it's it's so relevant to where we are right now you know, I mean, the first song on the on the joint is "Slave Owners," like that's the yeah. name. Of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, pocket pocket full of slave owners. I mean, you know, and and I mean, I think I've carried around certain theories and thoughts ever since my days at Howard, and you know, I've always thought it was weird that us as black people had to accept so much stuff in America. Yeah, like like. like we have to we have to celebrate President's Day for presidents <laughs> who would have us in chains. Right. You know, I, yeah. I literally, if I put my wallet out right now, our currency has people who would who hated us <laughs> on our currency. Right. You know, the very first president of the United States, George Washington, is a superhero and crossing the Delaware for three hundred slaves. Five. Father of the nation, father of the nation, father of the nation. Right. You know. So 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 you know. So there's a lot of theory. I mean, and and it's and I mean it elevates, but and not to go on a tangent. And I I think this is great. I appreciate the platform to do this. But like when you look at even when we say Black Lives Matter and the the con comparison of All Lives Matter. Well, once again, I'm a person who I'm, I'm a songwriter. I'm a fan of the words of of the combination of words. So when you say all. You have to mean all, but right. you don't mean all. <laughs> if we look at the history of it, the Constitution was written majority of Thomas Jefferson. You look at the people who wrote the, Constitu the, the Constitution. They're slave old owners. You don't even believe what you're writing. Right. So, so, so when so so even from back then, when you were when you were talking about all, you weren't including us. So what because makes back me think then we, we weren't even all. We were three fifths. So what makes me think that you think of us when you say all now? Mm -hmm. You know what and I'm if saying? If you truly, if you truly, if you truly believe all lives matter, you wouldn't say all lives matter. You would understand what Black Lives Matter is about. You know you what would, I mean? You, you know what you would do? You would focus on the spots that you needed to fulfill to create the word all. Yeah. It, you know what I'm saying? It's it's as it's as simple as that. If you had eighty percent of lives that matter, but twenty percent over here was perishing, you would yeah. focus on the twenty so that you could then have all. It 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 is as simple. It is as it's simple. So as, as simple as that. But you but you know, and that's the and that's the tough part. We don't. Words are so powerful. If you take a minute to really really look at the meaning, and then look if people mean it. You know what I'm saying? Like just even the word peace. How many people say, "Oh, I love peace is so important to me." But how how many of us use it? Right, right. How many of us really cherish and hold it? 
we speak of it way more than we use it. And that's the same thing with the all stuff. It's like, how many of us man, live it? How many of y'all live it? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When you say all lives matter, do you live that? That's, or, that's you, or, you, or you say that? Are you just weaponizing it against Black Lives Matter? Exactly. Which right. obviously you are. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, the, the album really touched on a lot of that, a lot of that stuff. And, and there's a lot more, to, a lot more conversation needed for that, too. Exactly. And, and like to this day, um, a song that I listen to over and over just to remind myself um, is Tamir. Um, I mean, I, I listened to that song like when his birthday just uh, recently passed. I had to put the song on again and remind myself yeah. that, oh, he should be 17, I think now. But instead, he was 12 year old Tamir. Yeah. And when you and when you think of Tamir and it's the part where people have to. When you have to weigh it, when you think about it, he's 12 years old. And he wasn't given the liberty of playing with a toy gun like many kids have played right mm. he is shot in seconds that's not even the part i want to talk about the part the fact of like how long this young this little child laid on that cold floor his sister comes running over they tackle and and handcuff his sister and put her in the car still leaving him with a bullet in him laying on the floor and, and there's a point of like, at some point you realize that was a toy gun. Some point you realize that wasn't, that wasn't a real pistol. At some point you realize this is a child. Right. At some point you're close enough to him. We're not even debating other stuff, which is to me horrible. And you should be in jail for that stuff. Just pulling up and shooting a kid immediately. But where is your heart five minutes later when at this point now you, are we going into protocol? Or are we going into saving this kid's life? You're gonna let him lay there on the floor. You're not going you know, by himself. By by himself. You know what I mean? And that's the, that's the part where it's like, that's what that's that's why I wrote the song to me. And it was crazy because I brought in James Poiser and then uh, and I apologize because the guy who played guitar and my name is his name is escaping me right now. And I hate that his name escaping me. But I remember asking James, is he a father? I said I I only want fathers touching this, touching this song. <laughs> And it, it meant something to me because I want us to, we weren't writing a hot song. You know what I'm saying? We were writing a, a song and paying homage to the fear that we have and also paying homage to, to this young man who unfortunately was, was life was cut, cut short, you know? And, and I think the guitar player p paid, played through that pain. James Poyser, he, he produced through that pain and I sang through that pain, you know? Um, to hopefully get that point across. And you know, it's, it's crazy because, you know, through my life, I've written songs that I've helped people escape from things. I've helped you take your mind off of stuff. Or I'll bring you to a moment. You go, oh, I remember my first dance to that song. Or I remember where I was when I heard that song. And here's the song, probably for the first time, really, while I was writing a song where I said, I know you probably would never listen to this song again. But the one time you do listen to this song, I'm going to punch you so hard in your chest that you cannot forget it. I knew it. Now, some people will listen to it, but, but a lot of people said once they heard it one time, they were like, oh, yeah. And I wanted, to write, I wanted to write a song you couldn't escape from. Yeah, it's like Fruitvale Station. When I saw that movie, I said it's the best movie that I only want to see once. I'll never watch it again. But guess what? I got it. And mm -hmm. It was needed. And it was needed. You, you, that's not a that's not a movie that you watch just for entertainment purposes of like I'm just chilling. How yeah, yeah. But, but I but I but I need that message. Mm -hmm. I need them as brutal as the message is. I need it. So that was the first time from a writing standpoint. I knew I had to write something that I that people probably would never listen to again. And I was fine mm -hmm. with that. I was fine with like if I got your ear for one time, this is what I want to put in your ear for for this this moment. Do you ever perform it in, in show? Or is it just it's, so it's, heavy it's, where it's, it's like, it's, I can't um, even... I, when we first did the album, I did it and I cried through every performance. For Tamir's birthday, which was uh, not too long ago, I went on IG Live and I, and I was prepared to really go on IG Live and just sing the song. Just say, listen, this is his brother's birthday. I want to just sing a song, just pay homage and then sign off. And I probably, I mean, I... I probably cried for a couple minutes before I could even press play. Just like, it was just so heavy. The song is really, really heavy for me, you know? 
So uh, I, I I don't want to necessarily become a spectacle of it, right? I don't want to I don't want to be so me- like when I did the IG live on his birthday. When I signed off, I was just like, damn, because how I felt became bigger than the message. And really, I wanted the message. Come. I wanted to really stand stand strong and sing the song down so that you really got the message. But I couldn't, man, because uh, my 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 kids are about to be his age. You know what I'm saying? So I fear the the fear, the worry, the the pain from from the truth of that that story of Tamir. Uh, it, it's hard. It's hard for me. To, it's hard for me to sing it. But I mean, it, when I need to, I, I try my best to do it. Gotcha. So I got a, a, a one of our, one of the homies, uh, Demetrius Bell. He said, "Errol's one of the few artists that I buy two copies of all his work." He said, "One I open immediately, and the other I'm saving for." Not his children, but his grandchildren. Wow, <laughs> I, I've never heard that, and that's so beautiful. I, I, that's a, that's such a great reward, man. Thank you. I, I, I'm I'm really honored by that. That's because I, I I would do I would do something like that, mm-hmm. but I would like so you know it's crazy when you get to a place and I, and I think I, there's been a, a couple moments where I've had this moment where, you know, I would do that with like Bill Withers' work. You know what I mean? Like I'm gonna hold this record for my for my grandchild. I would, and to even think that anyone would, could ever see me the way I saw Bill Withers it blows me away. Totally, totally. You, you know what I'm saying? It's like it's hard to even wrap my mind around something like that. But I, but I'm thankful, man. You know, and we're we gonna keep working. Nico, so go through the process process of how you decided. Hey, I'm gonna reach out to Eric Roberson and and uh, see if this. Grammy nominated star will be just sit down and do a do a song with him. Oh, I ain't had none of that in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Grammy not Grammys. <laughs> Man, this is Arrow. This the homie. This <laughs> like, you want to work or what? Yeah, I, I got this fire over here. You want to work? Listen, man. This this brother. I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, Eric. Got to be well over a decade. Um, and it was, you know, it was just from you, you know, I, I I was familiar with your music from, I think the first song that I, I'd ever heard. It wasn't the 90s stuff. I was surprised to find that out, gotcha. like later. I didn't know about, I didn't know about the you 90s stuff. You go back to the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was totally Brian McKnight-esque and all, I was like, wow, look at him. But... <laughs> But uh, no, no, no. The first, the first record was the the Jazzy Jeff, the yeah. the rock with you. I mean, like I was like, damn, this is dope. Like that you know live I mean? version is killer. Oh yeah, yeah. Look, yeah. Look, yeah. look. So I had the, you know, I, I'm a DJ, so I had the um, the, uh, the 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 twelve inch, um, and it was with you and and Jeff in the studio. Y'all were sitting, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah a little yeah. twist and everything. Yeah, and yeah. so I'm. I'm listening, and you know, I had this, I had this uh, mixtape series, Jazzy Fat Nappy, and which is that, fire. that, Y'all which, was a, that which was a beast. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And 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 rock with you had is Jazzy Fat Nappy, it's hands down. So of course that was part of the the series and everything. And when you when you were coming to St. Louis to to you know perform, you're one of those artists that, you know. Everyone knows. Every one of your fans know you on a, a a more personal level because you you just you that's who you are. You 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 make it your business to not just be the guy on the stage, but you come come down. I mean, even when you're performing, you're like you're so conversational, and you're you're like it 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 it's evident that you study uh what did you say musical uh theater? Or, yeah, yeah music. I mean, th- your shows are like. A, a production, a, a, a true production. You know what I mean, like, and so, you know, with that, and and you being so personable, and us getting to know each other, and us just seeing each other all the time, you know, I was just, I was, I was just really comfortable to give you some CDs just to check out if you if you like them, yeah. they're cool. And what happened was I gave him a, a a CD full of beats and everything, and out of nowhere, maybe a year or so later. He calls up and he's like, yo, I wrote to one of your beats. <laughs> and, I, and this was when I didn't really know him that well. And I was like, this ain't, is this, this ain't Eric Robeson. <laughs> and he's like, yes, I am. And I'm like, 
well, if this is Eric Robinson, who is your favorite hip hop group? <laughs> and he was like, he was like a, a tribe called Quest. And I'm like, okay, all right, okay, all right. Yeah, so then, Imposter could have easily guessed that too, but I got you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like basically, it was like that. He he recorded the vocals, he sent it to me, and um, he he titled it, and I I knew that he was gonna be great on it. I already knew that, you know what I'm saying, and so. He sent it back and, and and I did some stuff. I added Vito to do a you know Black Spade. A verse. Yeah, Black Spade to, to, to do a verse. And um it took a while though. It took a while to to, to complete. Yeah. Um because Eric is a very busy dude. So you know what I mean like because I don't wanna I don't wanna make a move without him signing off. You know what I'm saying? On the sound and, and how it's how it's going. Um but I mean like it wasn't all it look, I was procrastinating. When when I got to a certain step, I tried to reach out and it you know it was roadblocks here and there, but eventually, thankfully, we were able to, you know, um, communicate, and yeah. it was, it was it was ready. You it know, was magic. It's a dope song, man. Yeah, I love song. it. I'm honored, I'm, honored, I'm honored to be on it. Yeah, yeah I'm I'm mad on it. Thank you, thank you so mm-hmm. much for that. To love herself. By the by, way, by the way, Paris. <laughs> Paris brother sends a shout out. She she's actually in the studio recording uh, Paris the King, and so she sends a shout out or whatever. But um, actually, when we were doing a show here in Minneapolis, we got a chance to hang out with Paris, and you said um, and and no, she said you were like the first person to ever purchase her the CD, the now infamous CD. Yes, you know, and, and, well, you know, first and foremost, man, you. It's very important for me, and I, I mean, I can count on one hand how many times somebody has been able to give me a CD without me purchasing. Maybe one time where I didn't have like some money on me, or whatever, or might, at least I'm gonna give you my CD. Because at the same time, I always want to show people that yo, it's a business first. Right. It's a business of music first and foremost. So if you're here to sell CDs, don't hand it to me. Let me let me let me pay for it. Let me earn it so that one when I play it and enjoy it. That, that I've earned that enjoyment too. You know what I'm saying? I, I I want to. There's a better chance I'm gonna listen to it also if I hand you some currency for, hmm. for it as well. So yeah, I do. I do remember that. I do. I do remember that. Um, because she she eventually ended up doing, she ended up doing a cruise. I want to say too, uh, the Capital Jazz cruise, I believe. But but yeah, I mean, many, yo, you bring me Minneapolis. I got so many great memories. Of that in general, I mean, just that tunnel to get from the hotel to the to the venue <laughs> was always magical. Like I was like, "Yo, this is so it's crazy." Skyway. The weather's so bad that like the the hotel is connected, like uh, like a mile away is connected. Was always, and 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 to, you know, we've always had some great powwow. What I remember is us getting there, and it's got to be ten fifteen degrees below zero, <laughs> like, beyond brick brick freezing. And Harry comes pulling up in this in, in some like sedan or some car. It was like, uh, like yeah. a charger or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah, in the car in that charger, yeah. Yep. And dude gets out with just like a t shirt and sweats on. <laughs> <laughs> and like is walking up to the airport like entrance. And I'm like, I got on like a, a triple goose goose down. I'm like, I'm I'm like and I'm freezing, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm freezing. And we're looking at him like, yo, this dude got to be an alien, man. Like, how are you walking through? Pop, I mean, pop the trunk. You and Demo. Yeah, me and Demo. He popped the trunk, is talking to us. He put, and I'm like, yo, man, stop talking so we get in the car. I'm freezing. And he's like, put this t shirt on, like, yeah, man, so how was the flight? All right, cool. Let me put this bag in. Y'all, y'all hungry? Y'all want something to eat? I'm like, how are you talking as if this, this ice storm is not affecting you right now? Like, you uh. know what I mean? And then he got back in the car and we and we and we was kicking it. But you know, Harry, he's Harry like, it's cold. Yeah. There's people coming out. I'm like, oh yeah, it's sold out. We good. Yeah, but that's the beautiful thing about Minneapolis. I was like, why are we here during this bad weather? But but cats were still coming. They were like, you can pack pack place, even even 15 below zero. Which God God bless y'all because I wouldn't have been coming out. You know, <laughs> see nobody in that cold. I, look, I said the same thing before I moved here. But I'm telling you, after you survive that first winter that first one is gonna kick your butt but after you survive that first one it's like yep it's gonna be winter you know so um that's the, that's, that's when you rock shorts and t-shirt i i he didn't take shorts he did he uh, t-shirt 
Okay. Well, sweat. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and sweats, he right? Well. He might as well have a pair of shorts on. <laughs> I mean, he might as well, because I was like, listen, that that wind and that cold disrespected everything you had on. <laughs> The, the clothes will almost be a disservice because your co- your clothes get so cold that now your clothes is like it's like putting right. on you. Mm-hmm. Harry, yeah, was- you got a coat in the car though, right? Oh yeah, I think I have one in the car. I'm sure. He well, might have. he yeah. might. Have. I doubt yeah. it. Yeah, just in case, you know, you always got to keep something in case the car stops or something. <laughs> you know, that's their old grandmother with. So. I will never forget that day though. I to this day I could tell you exactly I could almost tell you exactly what you had on. You had gray. You had gray sweats on. Yeah. I could tell you exactly. I mean, to the T, him getting out that car. And I'm like, yo, are you cra-? like I'm I'm like, I'm scared for his life. That's how cold it was. Like you took me you took me to um to um to a radio station one time. Okay. And it was I felt like my eye the 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 my eyeballs were drying up. Yeah, that's how cold yeah. it was. Like you yeah, so cold like, that you cry immediately. That walk, that walk to the to the to the door of the radio station. When I opened my mouth, everything in my mouth dried, like just dried <laughs> up. I was like, I know that cold. How am I supposed to breathe? That this is this is this ain't Chicago. This went. This is something different. This is this is death. Like this is like you can't stay out there for so long. But shout out to y'all, man. You know, and then and then Minnesota, <laughs> look while y'all building. I know I'm going way off. Y'all build y'all stadium. Oh. Y'all had nerve to play outside, right? Like, play for like two years at, at, a, at a college. I'm like, yo. Mm. What, what's crazy is there were a group of like traditionalists who were like, well, in Metropolitan Coliseum, we always played outside. Let's keep it outside. And I'm like, uh, you won't see me there. I'll be. <laughs> <I'm good. laughs> nah. Not so, at all. So, so check this out, because I, I want to take it back to the beginning, if you don't mind. Um, and, and just because you are such a pioneer in independent music, you literally paved the way for it. You were ahead of the Internet before the Internet became what it is. Mm. You paved the way. You started out at Howard University with a record deal under Warner Brothers. How do you yeah. get that deal? What happens while you're in that deal? And then what makes you say, you know what? I'm good. Well, I, I wish I wish I could say that I said I'm good. <laughs> uh, well, I, guess I, I guess eventually I did say it. So at Howard, there was a group called Shy. Uh, and if I Ooh. ever, which were friends. You were there with them? I was there with them. And uh, oh, I remember they gave, their, they gave their tape to a DJ uh, in D.C. And he played it. That night and that song took off it became a huge record within so mind you one day you're in class one day in a dorm room as small as what you see in the screen two weeks later they were on a senior hall and uh they had to finish their album up in two weeks after that they got signed to gasoline alley and they they made an album in two weeks i think the song went on to sell like eight ten million records that's just a single and then the album sold two three million just just off of the strength of the single Jeez. And I told him, I said, listen, here's my demo. Just pass it. Can you just pass it to somebody? And um, and they did. And they passed it to somebody. And uh, eventually the phone started calling. And, that, and that, that started me going back and forth to L.A. while in school for almost a year, almost a, a, a long period of time, let's just say. And eventually led to a deal with Warner Brothers. Uh, Benny Medina, who at that time was was also executive producer for Fresh Pins of Bel Air. Yeah. I, I, I kind of knew he was leaving. I, I, I probably say ignorantly was ignoring. I didn't know anything any better. So when he left Warner Brothers, I pretty much left with him, thinking that he was going to go to another label at that time. But at that point, he focused more on TV. Mm-hmm. So so I went immediately to Island Records. Um, a guy named uh, Leotis Clyborne signed me there. And then amazingly, Almost a day after I signed there, I, I didn't even make it back home yet. Um, Hiram Hicks took over Island and just fired everybody, dropped everybody, cleaned wow. the house. Dang. And uh, and you remember Myron? Remember uh, Myron, the singer Myron? So Myron became was Ooh. his artist. He brought in Myron, uh, who I know now. It was a phenomenal guy. And um, so with, with Warner Brothers, I had the song The Moon that did very well. Yeah. I went on tour with Elder Barge and 
and uh, and had great a, a great level of success for it. But then all that stuff dried up. There was no other deals that came about that. Now the moon wasn't playing on the radio anymore. The show offers wasn't wasn't really uh, coming through like it needed to. So I was like, you know what? Let me go back to school. Let me go back to school and regroup. And it was it was the, the toughest decision I ever made, but it was probably the best decision I ever made outside of that too. Outside of like getting married and having my kids and stuff like that. It's it's uh, I, the artist you see today. I wouldn't be if I didn't go back to school on those hard days. Not not even education was great. All that stuff was great, but it was more of like regrouping and realizing that my music couldn't bail me out of everything. At that point, I, I used to I, probably before that I thought. When I walk in a room and I open my mouth, all problems are solved. All girls are gonna want me, all whatever, whatever. And I had to start realizing that like a lot of stuff wasn't gonna hold true. And and and, and I think Hiram, which later I was able to work with him, uh, in in another in a songwriting capacity, but I had to learn that like sometimes it wasn't about music. I wasn't getting dropped because of music. I was getting dropped because of business. And it, and, and truth be told, he didn't care what my song sounded like. It'd be one thing. He's like, "Yo, the album's done. You want to hear the album first before you, before you clean house?" He's like, "Nah, no, I got my own guys. I don't care what they sound like. I don't even want to be tempted. I, no, everybody leave." So that when you see something like that, now you realize you got to bring more to the table. Not only as a businessman, but I, my my heart got to be different too. And I don't mean just tougher, but I got to be more genuine. You know. So I, when I went back to school, I became a better student. I became a better person all all across the board. Um, so when I graduated from Howard, my focus was something different. Like, you know, I, I was really, I really went probably two years just introducing myself to everybody as how I'm Eric Robeson, the songwriter. How I'm Eric Robeson, the songwriter. You want a song, I write a song for you right now. I can go to the studio, have a song for you in 10 minutes, what you need. And so every president, every label, every a &R, every artist knew me as Eric Robeson, the songwriter. So then, of course, now, when the Philly movement pops off and, and everybody in Philly, which at the time I didn't live there, but I was working there, everybody in Mama's getting signed, except for me. Why? Because the A&Rs are coming to Philly. They go, okay, give me Jill, give me Floor Tree, give me, give me music, give me Vivian Green. Oh, that's Eric Robertson, songwriter. He don't want no deal. They just pat, just pat, pass by me because rightfully so. I said, yo, I'm Eric Robertson, the songwriter, you know, um, so it, it, in hindsight, it was a beautiful thing because when I look back, I well, at that time, at that time, were you still performing, or were you just strictly just pushing out hits? At that, at that time, <laughs> at that time, I mean, for two years, I I wasn't performing. I was strictly like I'm just writing songs. I went through enough deals, um, went through enough deals because uh, even I, I was doing a group thing in Atlanta at one point, and that fell through. I mean, it's just like, like yo, man, I'm just gonna focus on on getting these songs. I'm trying to I'm trying to put a song on everybody out there who who won it, you know, but then eventually that was steady uh, pay, right? You know, it's was it's, it's weird because I'm gonna tell you it's crazy. The the tough part as a songwriter, I had some of the biggest checks I've ever received in my life. I made more money in a year than I have ah, that's not true. Well, I, I more money in a couple of months than I've ever made in, in a couple of months before. Right. But then you might go a whole year and not make another dime because you were, you were pretty much at the mercy of whatever uh, the artist was going to do or whatever the label was going to do. So I like, for example, I signed, I, I got a, a publishing deal with EMI and it was a great, I mean, it was a huge, huge check. It was great. It, it was, I mean, I, I can't say life changing, but I could have easily bought a house, could have easily bought a car, could have easily, went balling right and at the time i had 16 songs placed on different artists all throughout and not one of those 16 songs came out that year for whatever reason like so there was a group called trey knox that was will will smith's label and i probably wrote like seven songs on just them right so that group doesn't come out uh gina thompson there was a whole bunch of artists you know who who just didn't come out but during that time now I'm seeing all this publishing money just dwindling, right? And I'm working with my friends. I'm working with Jill. I'm working with music. I'm working with Vivian Green. I'm working with friends. And my friends started getting signed, you know? And my friends started selling millions of records. And that's really what bailed me out of my <laughs> falling in this publishing deal. The tough part was like when I, when I, had, when I was a, just a songwriter, 
I was like, I had to live broke no matter how much money I had. I had more money in the bank then than I have now, but I had to live broke because I didn't know when the next check was coming. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Whereas when I started becoming an independent artist, I remember when I was like, I'm gonna put this album out and I'm just going to rock with it. Even if I was only making $300 a week off of the, off of the album, I, I had more control of, of that $300. I knew that every time I sat in a barbershop and there was three guys in there, I was like, first of all, I'm never walking into a barbershop again paying for a haircut. I'm going to sell enough CDs in this barbershop to pay for this haircut every time I come in here. And the same way if I went to a restaurant, same way I went to everywhere I went, I am going to sell enough CDs to provide for where I was. If, if I was walking into a record store and wanted to buy five albums, I better, I better sell five albums in this, in this uh, parking lot before I go in there. You know what I mean? Yo, fam, what kind of music you like? You like Jill? Yo, well, check this out. My name's Ed Robeson. I'm a songwriter. This album. Yo, check, yo, put it in your car. Listen to it for a second. If you like it, whatever you want to spend, you know, and I mean, just hustling, just boop, 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 boop. And I found like, okay, I wasn't making as much money as a songwriter, but it was consistent. Why? Because it was my own platform at that point. So by no means was I the first independent artist. If I did anything different, what was different was once you got to selling a certain amount of point, uh, albums, let's say uh, even the Dwelle, who, who was an independent artist first, let us see was an independent artist first. I knew all of them as independent artists. Kim was an independent artist. But once you sold 10 to 15 to 20,000 records, the labels would come in and, and sign you and then you know you would go the major route. And I was like, all right, I've been the major route before. What happens if you don't sign them? What happens if you just keep selling independently? What happens if you just, let's see where this goes. And and, I, and that, if anything, that's what that was what was different for me. You know, I was like, let's sink or swim. Let's see. And, you know, sure, would have been great to have had like the really radio muscle or the tour support. But at the end of the day, you know, we all kind of back in square one. You know? yeah. <laughs> now, now everybody's independent, you know what I mean? It's true. And, it's true. And, and some can benefit off of like the history of the radio muscle that they had when they were signed to a major label and stuff like that. And, and Merry Christmas, you know, what I love is the fact that I can, I can write about whatever I want. And I think my, my fan base who rocks with me knows that. So they're not always necessarily listening, saying, was he going to write another newness? It's more about what is he going to write? What journey is he going to take us on now? You know, and I, and I appreciate I appreciate that patience that they that they allow me to have. So when you wrote uh, "Emotional Roller Coaster," were you writing it specifically for Vivian, or were you like, "Hey, I got this song, and Vivian would be great for it"? Or, or how does that come about? What, what she she and I co-wrote that song, and I actually will be honest with you, she wrote she wrote majority of "Emotional Roller Coaster." If anything, that that I guided more in that song was probably the more direction. The, the first idea, she, she came with the idea. It was like, I have this idea of writing the song. And it, and it was more of like a pop. So it was more, not, not pop. So it was more like a Tony Braxton, Tony okay. Braxton type baby face feel. And I was like, let's take it soulful. So I brought in Oshun Day, and then we, we made it into more, stand uh, up. more of a soulful record. I mean, and, and probably Vivian, in all honesty, probably was more Tony Braxton-ish when I met her. And we, we brought her more to like the, we would say Neo Soul or just the soul side, you know what I mean? But, um, and that was how, I mean, whereas, let's say this, there was a song called What Is Love on the album that, yeah. that I, probably, I probably wrote majority of. So we, we would just write. What I would tell you though was, yes, the songs were written for her uh, because we were really working on trying to like get her artist, artistry up. But she was in a really bad relationship at the time. I was friends with her boyfriend. To, to this day, when I see him, I won't say his name. Shout out. Um, he's always like, "Man, I, I, I'm like eternally dragged on this on this album. You know, you know like just, just <laughs> eternally dragged." I'm like, "Hey, man, thank you for the publishing." You know, but she lived in Philly. She would either take the train down, or I would go up to Philly, pick her up, and drive back. And on that time, in the car, she would be like. He didn't call me back today. I just don't know what's going on. And she'd be sad. She'd be really, really sad. And we would talk. We would get in the, we'd get in the studio, and we might talk for like an hour or two hours just about why this relationship isn't working. So then now it's time to write. We can't now then be like, you know, 
you make me happy. You're the best thing that ever happened in my life. You know what I mean? It was like, it, the only thing we could write was, I'm on an emotional roller. And let's make it sad. Let's make it even darker. Let's play minor chords of this thing. Let's, yeah. let's make it deep. Mm-hmm. What's the next? What is so, so we were like writing these songs, which, because that's where she was at the time. You know what I mean? It was like really, and I mean, that's the, that's the blessing of, of a lot of the, the people I've had a fortunate opportunity of writing with or working with. It's really like writing where they were. Like, let's talk first. Let me see who you are. And then let me see if I can put something that says something about you, um, you know, on your album. Previous cap. Uh, pre- previous cat is always funny because, you know, music soul child, man, is one of the most unique people I've ever met in my entire life, not just from a singing standpoint, but just from a natural who he is. I mean, he, he, he's just a different kind of dude. Amazing, amazing dude, but a different kind of dude. I never met a person ever like music. Before. I, I listened to his podcast with Quest Love, and I was like, "Yeah, this is a different kind of dude." <laughs> yeah, yeah, his, that was a, he was he, he he even said himself. He said, in a, "So if I be fair, he said in that podcast, he said I probably would call my publicist and tell them to stop booking interviews for me because I'm not in a place to interview." <laughs> right. So yeah. you know, so mind you, uh, the time. That, so what I'll say with previous cats, previous cats was a song I wrote in college. With my boy Jermaine Mobley, another another Howard Howard wow. alum, and um, I meet music. Uh, I play previous cats for music before he ever had a record deal. And mind you, a lot of times, even my relationship with music started from he was like, he came to touch of jazz, and his approach to music was so different that a lot of times I'll say, "Yo, I want you to sing this song just so I can hear how you would sing it." I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't think music was going to ever get signed or or like really blow up. Not to say I didn't believe in his dream or anything. Like that. I don't know if he was thinking about that at the time. He just came in and he was just like, I want to learn. I want to be dope. And he had this really, really interesting approach because he sung behind the beat, but aggressively in a low tone. And sure, you might have like a D'Angelo who would sing in a falsetto behind the beat in a soft tone, but I had never heard a person who can consistently sing like right back in the cut, like right, right, like a little bit behind the bass, but it's still in that good groove area in this like really brassy baritone voice, uh, uh, you know? So we were like, and back then, even before, before any album, he was really, really different. So I was like, yo, sing the ABCs. Let me hear you sing it. He was like, wait, I mean, that's how we were in the studio. Like, yo, well, sing this, sing, sing Silent Night. You know, it was like, we just wanted to hear him sing something to see how he would approach it because he just heard it differently. So I played previous cast for him. And he says, yo, that song's dope. I want it. I want it for my second album, though. And I'm like, I mean, I, all right, I appreciate you dreaming because <laughs> you, <ain't even, laughs> you don't even have a record deal right now, but you want it for your second. No worries. No worries. We don't even talk about it. We go on. Before you know it, he gets signed to Def Jam. Cool. This is great. We're now working on, on his first, on, on his album on Def Jam. We record Merry Go Round. Uh, we work with Odyssey to record another song. So lo and behold, here's here's his first album. I say, yo, you know, we still got this previous cat song. No, no, I want that for my second album. It says the same thing. Touche, you was right. You say your second album. We are working on your first album. No worries. And then like the first album comes out, sells two, four million copies, whatever it sells. Amazing. And then like two years later, he called me up like, yo, I'm ready to do that song. What song are you talking about? <laughs> that previous cat song. I'm working on my second album. It's like, <laughs> who, are, who are you? <laughs> you know what I'm like who, who are you? Like, you know what I mean? But, and, and lo and behold, he comes and he, he knocks it out the park and, and you know, the song is, you know, I, and I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, Mary Ground, I felt really good about, I remember at the time I was working with a lot of people at Def Jam and I remember walking through the offices of Def Jam and room by room, they're playing Mary Ground. I feel real good. I'm like, it's got to be a single. It's like everybody, the whole, <laughs> the whole floor was playing Mary Go Round, right? Lo and behold, it doesn't become a single. No problem. Lose no sleep. Wait, it's not, wait, hold on. It's not a single. Mary Go Round was never a single. Now, mind you, keep it 100. It's a song that he has sung throughout his entire career, which I take as a great compliment for it not being a single, right? Um, next album, he does Previous Cats. 
we body this song, right? It's like, oh man, this this is this is it. It I need that single, right? I need that single right. love. I need that single money, right? And I need that radio <laughs> money, right? So right. uh Jermaine Mobley's uh, manager at the time is getting married in Jamaica. We are all in Jamaica, right? So I do the song with Jermaine Mobley. We all in Jamaica. I'm singing at at the wedding. We chilling. We at the, some restaurant, some villa restaurant. Lo and behold, Russell Simmons, Leo Cohen, all the entire executive staff of Def Jam is sitting one table over from us, yeah. right? Who would have ever thought, right? So we playing it cool. We're like, all right, that's cool. <laughs> and, and looking over, but I ain't looking over. Right. I'm, not, I'm, lo- I'm looking over, but I ain't looking over. And Russell Simmons is talking, and he's saying, he's saying, yo, how y'all got me going to this wedding and I ain't got a fresh tee. This is like, yo, you got to find me a tee. I don't, like, where you going to find one? I'm not wearing this to the wedding. I'm not going if you can't find it to me. He's like, yo, like, give me that shirt right there. Like, so he literally li- turns and points to me says, see that guy right there, that white shirt? Give me that white shirt right there. Like, I need that white shirt. Well, y'all can't find that here in Jamaica? This is what Russell said. He's going on the full <laughs> tangent, right? So, so, I say th- so I say this. I say, Mr. Simmons, how you doing? My name's Eric Robeson. I got another YT. Like, literally, I never want tax still on it at the villa if you want it. You about my size. Is that, yo, can, you, can y'all go to his villa to, to get the joint? So then now they're arranging, right? His, his assistant is now, our villa's down the street, whatever, whatever, to go in and get the T-shirt, which now breaks the ice mm. of all of us talking. Right. So Russell kind of drifts off. But but here's uh, Kevin Lyles. Right. Who at that point now is president of Def Jam is standing there. It's all of us. So now it's like yeah. he's like, yo, that's that's dope. You donate your T-shirt and this. And that. Like, no problem. It's cool. Yo, by the way, my name is Eric Robeson. It's Jermaine Mobley. We we are some right producers. We work. You know, we we we, we on um, case record. We did you know, music. So like, yo, just happen to be sitting next to you. But we we work with your company. Right? He's like, oh, where are you, the music? What song? So I said, oh, we just did Previous Cats. Oh, man, great song. Not a single, but a great song. Great song. Oh. Oh. Yo, when you talk about Crushed. He was just coming. Oh, body man. blow. I left. I was like four foot, four foot seven when I left the restaurant. Like, he chopped me in half. <laughs> like, it, and, it, it, and that's it, so New York, too. It was so right. New York. It was so, but that's how, you know, that, yo, them A&Rs was so brutal back then. And mind you, the president, he was like, he was like, oh. Not a single. <laughs> great song. Not a single, but a great song. Great song. And then he just walks away. Just walks away. And we like, looked there like, that's like, how really, we found out. You had to stab me? Right, right. right. Did you have to shank me? Did you have to shank me before you left, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Kevin Lyle? But that was just Damn. so funny, man. That, like, uh, I remember, I remember. I, and, and, and you know, because I think we had really high hopes. We we thought the song was a great song. And once again, it's another song that nine times out of ten, if you go to a music soul child concert and he's he's doing an hour and a half or something like that, he's going to sing that song too. And that song wasn't singing. So I, I I take great pride that you know, and it's and it speaks one to how much he respected my writing, but then also that we gave him like the best we had. You know what I'm saying? Like you know, I try to write something that was so impactful. Um, that you know, it, last, it lasts a long time. Have you ever thought about putting that on, like re re releasing, or yeah, you know I mean, because your version is just uh, like that's the version that I've come to know, even though I know yeah, the yeah. version, but your version is the one that's so impactful to me. Had you ever said, like, you know what, I'm gonna revisit it? Well, you know, that's crazy because if I if I work hard to find it, and it's probably all on like hard drives or whatever, there's there's a copy of every song I've sold for everybody there's a copy of me singing it you know what i mean mm-hmm. so and now what i would say is that for a long time i was i was thinking about and it could still happen i was thinking about doing an album called covers whereas me covering the songs that i wrote for other people and it, and, it, and it may happen i mean um i haven't really focused much on it as as much but but even like the process people they have they have like my version of merrick around my version of, of like previous cats like they got all that stuff you know what i mean so um the songs i did with case or uh you know like the charlie wilson stuff like you know all that stuff is there's a there's a version of me somewhere of me singing it you know um so yeah maybe maybe we will uh one day look back and say all right let's let's do a, a covers album of, of of my own personal covers got you. rico you got any questions for uh brother arrow eric roberson 
Did we lose Biko? Uh oh. He might be. I think, he yeah, might I think we lost him. He, he looked broke. He, he looked broke. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. There you go. So, so Biko, you got any questions for Brother Eric Robertson, the Arrow? Uh, I I've been really meaning to round up you, uh, Fonte, um, uh, Robert Glasper, most deaf, and y'all. Uh oh, I think we lost him again. Because but all y'all are like, hold on, hold on, go can back. You hear me? Go back. You got yeah. me. Go back. Well, he, we need he started to. breaking up, but you named some amazing stuff there. So yeah, but 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 yeah. So you you well you always say, oh he might have froze up again. Now nah, he's here. Ah uh, uh, no, nah, he he yeah he. So, so yeah. I'm a, here's the deal. I'm gonna pick up his point while he unfreezes. Because can you hear me? No, you know we can half no, hear no. you and can't half hear you. You you might need to sign back in. Yeah, he froze up again. <laughs> Hey, this is the technology we live with in 2020. Cancel 2020. Cancel 2020. <laughs> but yeah. so, so, but, and I think we got them back. But I'm so I. What I'm gonna say is something that, like years ago, once again, we're going back to these um, car rides that we would have when we, before, like the sound check and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, so uh, what Biko was just talking about, he's like you and Fonte. Now he said Robert Glasper. But I remember, first of all, the, the Tigolero is amazing. Amazing. But I remember before Tigolero, before Tigolero, there was talk of you, Fonte, Duele, and maybe even uh, AD, Anthony David. Like, did that ever, was that what, just like a conversation what, or? Well, what, 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 it, what it really is, so me and Fonte have always talked about, way before Tickler, we were always saying we were going to do an album together, and just off of, off of friendship, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's my bro, you know, for real. That's my musical blood brother, you know what I'm saying? So uh, we always talked about we were going to do some stuff. Good, you me, can get me in his graces again, because we're, we're offline now, and he's probably mad at me. Say, give you what? <laughs> get me in his good graces again, he's probably mad at me. We'll work, we'll work that out. I need to hear the story why you why you mad, but we'll work that out. Look, it was after a concert. I might have had a few of these gentlemen <laughs> jacks, and um, we just put on a great show with the foreign exchange. I mean, they ripped it, ripped it, ripped it, ripped it. And I got up there on stage, and I'm like, if y'all want to uh, hear an encore for the foreign, come uh, on. And they crowd going wild, and, this, and I go back. They, they say, man, we ain't say nothing about no encore. <laughs> we, and they had just literally put on a, a ninety minute show. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That, that was that was the Jack target. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you probably did that for me several times, so it's all good. You know what I mean? Uh, um, but but I, what I will tell you is that me, me, Raheem, and Dwelle have talked about, and and we, I don't know why we haven't done it. We've talked about doing a, a group called Red, mm. Raheem, Eric, and Dwelle. Um, we, we've cut one song <laughs> that's unreleased. Uh, we cut, no, that's not true. Cause we put it out on uh, B boy, amazing, amazing keyboardist on his album. Uh, we put that song out, but there has been talk. Uh, Raheem, Raheem was really, really gung ho about putting that group together. At one point he was championing that group and we had all committed, but, but it, you know, you got to do the work too. You know what I'm saying? Not, not, that's no shot to anybody, but it's like, we're all busy. We're all working on different stuff. So hopefully we can get it done. I'll, I'll be more than happy to do it. You know what I'm saying? So there's, there's, there's always talks with different groups, different people that we'll get together and do some collabs and stuff like that. So, you know, it just got to, I, I never look at a timeline. So I think all of it's going to happen. Just when will it happen? Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. I, I, I think because froze again, are you on froze brother? You back with us? Can you hear me? Yeah, there, there we go. go. Yep. There you go. There we go. <laughs> All right. So what was it? You said right. You said uh, oh, no, no, no. Glasgow, Fonte, and Most Def. I think I, I think all four of y'all, and and it could be more. I'm I'm just saying like all four of y'all got this quality of like you could you could easily be a comedian as well. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, and so like right. I think that y'all should form like a rat a rat pack type of thing. Like a some sort of you know what I mean? Like something. We're all for cause cause look, G Glassberg, more than anything, that dude is a, a bona fide fool. 
Glasper is crazy. the funniest. And I just think that all four of y'all would be dope, like on a on a showcase. Glasper is the funniest, hands down, musician. The funniest. Hands up, funniest musician I have ever met. Now, mind you, I'll say this. Thaddeus Trebet on bass. Thaddeus Trebet is a close second. Funniest musician I've ever heard in my entire life. But Robert Glasper gets the cake. But Like, if he couldn't play keys, he could easily be a stand-up comedian. Y'all could and, add Avery Sunshine into that mix. No, and that's what I was going to say. And that's what I was actually about to say. If we're naming a group, though, if we're naming a group of Hilarious! If if I'm if I'm building an ensemble of like we're getting Easy. on stage, sketch comedy, give me in this order. Give me Robert Glasper. Give me Avery Sunshine, cause she is a clown, <laughs> and I mean that in every. She know that's my soulmate sister right there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, give me give me Fonte. <laughs> I the clown too, right? Now I don't, I don't know Most Def personally, but I know he's hilarious. So give me Most Def. There's a few other. There's a few others in here who's going to match, who's going to match our ignorance to the <laughs> highest level. You know what I'm saying? Um, and you know, like even like, uh, uh, yo, Bilal, low key man, hilarious, Hila- hilarious. <laughs> it, 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 it's, a different kind of, it's in a different kind of context. You gotta, you gotta catch him. You gotta catch it differently. You know what I'm saying? Because he's just a different dude. Layla Hathaway, dry harmony. I mean, dry, dry, dry comedy, but an assassin. An ass, just an assassin. Like you talk about, she'll walk by you and like say we're on a cruise or whatever, and she'll be like, she'll just say something really like, "Did they really think those shoes match?" <laughs> and you be like, "What you just say?" And then you look over and be like. Oh my God. But that's, if you ever heard any stories of Prince, Prince was like just this dry, murderous <laughs> comedy. You know you what I'm saying? Gotta, you got to tell the story when y'all ran the press with Demo and, and, and oh my to, God. To put it to put it out there for the people who aren't familiar with Demo. You so Demo, about Demo's, my background, Demo's my background singer and hype man for over 12, 13, 14 years. He's been my road dog, uh, you know, and I'll never forgive him for ruining my chance of meeting Prince. I'm in, I'm in L.A. This is probably, I don't know, 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, and uh, we get a call that Prince is going to be at the show. It's me, Brand New Heavies, Karen Wheeler, and Victor Duplay in L.A., and Prince is coming in. Now, mind you, though, I think Prince is coming for the overall thing, but yet I heard I'm on his radar. He's coming, like, to see me perform. Oh, wow. Okay, great. We were in some place where you walk, like, when you come in through the back, it's, like, four stories worth of, like, stairs going straight up. That's, like, the entrance of, like, this this back entrance. It's, like, this crazy, like, long. I couldn't remember what venue it was. And I remember telling Demo, we were in the, we in the car, and I tell him, Yo, something really special is gonna happen tonight. Just be ready. My my mistake was not say, was not saying, yo, Prince is. Co-, but I don't want to jinx. I'm I'm one of them kind of people that if, like I'm not gonna. If there's a chance that Prince might come, I'm not gonna be like, yo, Prince is coming because then he's not coming, right? So I'm like, I'm gonna keep that kind of pocket, whatever. But I do say, yo, something special might happen. Just be ready. I get out the car. I'm walking in. He's like 15 steps. He's getting some out the trunk. Well, he's doing whatever he's doing. He's like a good 15, 20 steps behind me. I open up the door to these long stairwell. And there, lo and behold, when I look up, it's Prince standing at the top of the steps. Just standing there chilling. Oh, I'm no. just at the top of the step, right. And I go, oh, my God, that's Prince. Okay. Yeah. I got my little carry-on bag or whatever. And I'm like, all right. I'm start walking up the steps. I'm cool as a fan. I'm good. About to meet Prince. <sighs> This this is dope. This is this is you know this is one of the moments, right? And not to mention most of our friends who met Prince. Next, thing you know what happens? You next, thing you know, you're at his house. You're playing music at his house. You're in the studio record. It's like he and he he brings you in. You're having Bible study with the dude. It's like he's cooking pancakes. I'm playing basketball. <laughs> Every person I know who has met Prince, next to you know, they're at his house, and it's like y'all family now, right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, I'm walking up this here, going by to meet Prince. This is crazy, and. 15 steps, 15 seconds later, whatever, 
you hit a door slam open and it's Demo. He, he, he got his bags, he's trying to, and he looks up and he says Prince. And he goes, oh my God! <laughs> At the top of his lungs. <laughs> and Prince, as if he choreographed it, just slowly slid and turned and walked away. And then this little small Mexican security guard who was like, who's Prince's bodyguard, just walks up and he got his arms crossed. He's just looking down at us like, yo, move over. Like, y'all messed up, move over. He don't have to say nothing. I already, I can look at his face and tell, he's telling me move to the other side of the wall. Like, y'all blew it. <laughs> y'all blew it. Y'all messed up. And I get to the top of the steps and I forgot, I'm trying to remember her name. It was a DJ <laughs> friend of mine. She's on top. Uh, what's the DJ? She she really really popular DJ, uh, in LA. Um, when I get to the top step, she Prince's back is turned to me, and she's facing me. And I get to the top step, so I look over there, and like Prince is not even acknowledging, like acknowledging my existence, but yet she's looking at me, and she just goes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It was, so I, what I did hear is that he did stay for the show. He did oh, stay for the show, but I never, ne- never got a chance to meet him. God bless the dead, but um, never got a chance to meet him. So I, you know, I always rag Demo on just he, he ruined our chance to uh, to ruin my chance to meet. People, you know, <laughs> we, damn, we, Demo. We had, <laughs> right. Now I've, I've lived here in uh, Minneapolis since '08, and um, I've been in the room with him that I know of twice. Once was a King show. The other time was uh, I brought Algebra to the Dakota mm-hmm. and uh, we sold a good amount of tickets. So I'm like, okay, yeah, we're going to have a good show. It's nice. And I, when I got there for sound check, there's a curtain that's drawn upstairs. And I'm like, I heard about I, this curtain. I'm like, I'm like, why do they have a curtain drawn? I'm like, that's, that doesn't make any sense. I'm, I'm, and, but I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll address that later. Let me make sure algebra is good and all of that and go through sound check. So, as you know, things happen. You forget about the curtain. You're like, oh, yeah, I meant to ask him about such and such and such and such. Well, all of a sudden, the manager from the Dakota walks past me right before the opening act. Um, uh, Winslow Ashby and the mayor are about to go on. And, he goes, and she goes, Prince is here. And just keeps walking, and I'm like, "Hey, wait, wait, what'd you say?" She goes, "Prince is here," wow. and she points to where the curtain is, and I'm like, "Oh snap!" So uh, Jarrell, Jarrell Allen, uh, Algebra's uh, manager is there, and I and I'm like, "Look, I'm not gonna say anything to Algebra. That's on him." So I told him, and I and and I'm like, "Look, it's up to you if you want to say." And he said, "Nah, I'm gonna wait till she get done." But uh, and the thing was, is I knew instinctively I couldn't say Prince was in the building. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the next day I shouted it out everywhere. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy, man. I, I, yeah. So I was really didn't get a chance to meet Prince that night either, huh? Oh, no. Uh-uh. No. Wow. Wow. Uh-uh. And I've been to Paisley once with uh, Anthony David. Uh, when Prince had a, a private event or whatever, and, we, and uh, I still didn't meet him. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Yeah, so I never yeah. didn't meet him either. <laughs> there we go. We all in the, I, we all in the same boat. He was in the room. I was I was performing with with a uh, with Coltrane and Vito for uh, Hawthorne Head and we were up for high, and we were in Minneapolis, and they all saw him floating, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they saw him floating, and I I I just miss him at every turn. So. <laughs> they they saw him floating. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way to describe it. Well, look here. Um, I have monopolized. We have monopolized about ninety minutes of your time, and and right. honored, and could keep going for like with with the other podcast. They do a part two, so I'm gonna see if we can get you back for a part two of this. Um, because we never got into the you military mind with you and Anthony David wow. rapping because wow. all it, yeah because I'm I, I go deep with it <laughs> yeah yeah but uh, but um what I want to say sincerely is thank you for not for being here but for being here for being present being in the moment for gifting yeah. us with your music 
with your many blessings. Um, your music is, it resonates with so many because um, of, the, of, of what you put into it, the thoughtfulness that you put into it and, and the, the true raw emotion. And that's what we as fans appreciate. Uh, it, it's like you said, we're music fans first. And so yeah. with that being said, said I'm one of your biggest fans. Um, oh, thank man. you, Eric Robeson, for uh, uh, being with us. Any parting words? Nah, man, listen, I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate us doing business for so many years. How many times you brought me to St. Louis and Minneapolis, you know, and just, man, just being a solid dude, man. You're the same, same dude. You treat me exactly the same from the first moment we As are went you. to now, man. So, so it's been an honor and a pleasure, and let's keep building. That's what it's all about. All right, and uh, let's let's get through COVID so that we can see yes. Eric Roberson on stage live again. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Miko, you back with us. Uh, maybe, but any, but it, anyway, I want to thank James Biko because he's one of the dopest um, DJs and music heads out there. He had a show, Raw Authentic, that just um, finished its run on KDHX in St. Louis Radio, and it was one of the dopest places where you could hear the quote-unquote underground hip-hop, the new hip-hop, the neo-soul, the alternative soul. So we thank you for that. With that being said, this is Destination Unknown. This is the kickoff edition. I'm your host, Harry Colbert, Eric Roberson, Arrow, James Biko. Much love. Peace. Peace.